Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Emily Frozy, and I'm one of your hosts for Jamp Breakfast Club. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Neto, and I'm also one of your hosts. Hey, everybody. I'm Andrea Glick, one of your hosts as well. And I'm Mike Lawrence, and I'm thrilled that we've got such an amazing crew here for the Jamf Breakfast Club. What is Jamf Breakfast Club, you're wondering? I'm just here to eat pancakes. Is that correct? No, I'm kidding. We work with schools to talk about a variety of topics, including classroom management, uh, remote learning, and some of the best apps to enable teachers and students. We're open to all educators, IT admins, and school leaders to help them with the transformation of learning with and experience with Apple technology. So tune in for the Jamf Breakfast Club and get to learn how to use Jamf and Apple to help students succeed. Good morning and welcome to Jamf Breakfast Club. We are so excited you're here. I'm Dr. M. I'm one of your hosts this morning, and we are looking forward to sharing with you a great interview we have with Miss Amanda DeGrella. But also, we want you to stay tuned at the end of our presentation for a few of our special guests we met at ISTE 2022. And I think one of my other co-hosts is going to drop in a link here for JNUC, our Jamf Nation user conference. It's coming up in September with both a virtual and in-person option. We'd love to see you there. Please reach out to us with any questions you might have. Use this link. Um, you'll have our contact information to, to touch base with us if you need to, but we're look for, looking forward to it. Have fun at our first ever Jamp Breakfast Club. Well, welcome everybody to our first Jamp Breakfast Club here in the United States. Um, we are hosting Jamp Breakfast Clubs as a regular show covering a variety of topics, including classroom management, remote learning, top apps for parents and teachers, and so much more. Today we have Amanda DeGrella, the Education Technology Specialist from Mercy Academy in Louisville, Kentucky, joining us from Chicago, Illinois, where she happens to be on a conference with some students. So we really appreciate her time today, taking time out of her summer and from her work schedule to talk to us about the impact of using JAMP tools to support learning in her school. Dan and Doe and I will be asking Amanda a few questions during our time together to illustrate her journey as a campus, as her campus transitioned from being a JAMP Pro customer to a JAMP school customer and how she and her campus engage with students through technology, leverage device management to create powerful learning environments, and look at the importance of professional learning. We will start our time together with a few activities to get to know each other and then dive deeper into our technical questions. So to get started, Dan, what do you have? Well, thanks again for being here, Amanda. Um, I had told my two-year-old daughter I had a breakfast meeting. She was a little confused about that, but she she actually went out of her way with her mom to get donuts for me. And I know we're virtual, so I'm sorry you guys don't have donuts right now. But first question we got to ask, breakfast club meeting, Amanda, what's your favorite breakfast food? Well, I have to say my favorite breakfast go-to would be a chocolate croissant and a caramel ribbon crunch frappuccino from Starbucks. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Very in good. This, in the same vein of coffee and Starbucks, I would have to say, Dan, my favorite food is coffee. Gotta, gotta have at least one to two cups in the morning to get that started. <laughs> Cheers. Awesome. Well, thanks, Amanda. With uh, our next question, what is your favorite classic movie? My favorite classic movie would be The Parent Trap. And I would have to say, you have to stick to the original. Oh, I like the original. What about you, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. That is a classic. Um, for me, I think this is top of mind because I, I watched it last week, but The Sandlot. I think that movie holds water so well. Um, I don't know how many years old that is at this point, but uh, definitely a favorite for me. Awesome. And mm -hmm. I would have to say my favorite movie classic movie my children hate when I start it but it's the sound of music mm. <laughs> I love it every time why, it takes me back why did they hate it why do they hate it um uh, because I sing and act out every scene <laughs> and they're like mom sit down okay anyway. spare spare our audience that right now yeah I'm not gonna <laughs> not gonna break out in song here but all right well thank you for uh you know entertaining us with a few get to know you questions Amanda and with that Dan why don't you start off with our first like educator question? Yeah, we'll ask you the real ones now, Amanda. Um, oh. so the first one for me is what made you choose education and kind of walk us through your origin story and 
um, your background as an educator? So I would have to say, um, first of all, I graduated from the University of Louisville with a bachelor's degree in equine management um, and a minor in marketing. And why I have that degree is a whole nother story. Um, but I graduated, um, I'm actually from Arkansas. So I, when I came to the University of Louisville, it gave me in-state tuition. Um, and so I was able to finish that degree um, while only paying in-state tuition. Um, and then once I graduated, I really just had a hard time getting into that field of work. And so I decided that I really should have just gone with my initial instinct all through grade school, high school, everything that I really wanted to be a teacher. Um, and so I went back to Bellarmine University and got my master's in teaching. Um, I graduated in 2008. My career started with um, the late Paul Desarn. Um, he took a chance on me at 22 years old. I did not have a master's in teaching at that time, but I was in school to get my master's in teaching. And um, I went into teaching kindergarten. Mm. Um, and I was actually pregnant with my first daughter at the time. So then I continued through, I taught kindergarten for two years. Then I went on, they asked me to move to fifth grade to integrate my technology skills a little bit more. So then I taught fifth grade for four years. And then I was asked to um, begin the iPad initiation at that grade school. And so I was in that position as the ed tech um, role for five years before moving on to my current position where I have currently been the ed tech um, educational technology specialist at Mercy for going on. The, I just completed my fourth year. So that's oh. kind of a. Okay, two things. One, equine management. Wow, that's impressive. And I wanna dig it a little deeper into that later, maybe offline. And two, kindergarten. There's a special place in retirement for kindergarten teachers. I'm telling you right now, I think they walk on water. It's an amazing, amazing group of humans that teach kindergarten because that is like the foundation of learning. I love it. Thank you for being a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> I will or, say, I really, sorry. I nope. will say that I really enjoyed teaching kindergarten, but it wasn't until I taught fifth grade that I understood what you're saying, mm -hmm. that it was a lot. Right, right. It's, yeah, it's education as a whole is just such a magical experience. Um, and if you can see it from like K-5, did you, were you at the same campus from kinder to, and when you went to fifth yes. grade? Yes. So did you have any of your former students? Yes. Oh, yes. I love that. I love that. All right. So, fun, sorry, real quick, fun fact. I have some of those same students now at Mercy as. Oh, I love that. Oh, upperclassmen. Wow. Yes. That's oh, great. I love that. I love that. Do you have like photos as they progressed? I have like graduation photos from when they graduated like St. Rayfield and then, which was my old school and then my current school when we graduated or when they graduated. And then, I love that. yeah. Wow. Very cool. All right. So you're now at Mercy Academy. So tell us a little bit about Mercy Academy, kind of where you are, what students you serve, kind of what you got going on at Mercy Academy. Sure. So Mercy is the first girl STEM accredited school in the nation. Um, they're located in Louisville, Kentucky. We are sponsored by the Sisters of Mercy, um, serving just over 500 students in grades nine through 12. Um, Mercy has a diverse population of students um, from ethnicity to um, socioeconomic status to religious background, you name it, and they have a diverse population of students. Awesome. Very cool. Can you tell us a little bit more to Amanda about um, the types of jam solutions that you're using at Mercy um, and, and kind of how that plays a role into everything? Sure. Mercy began um, actually back when Jamf was Casper um, and then has since integrated into Jamf Pro. And then just after COVID, we made the decision to move to Jamf School, um, but we did that by integrating both JAMP Pro Solution and JAMP School Solution. Gotcha, so you're running a hybrid model right now? Yes. Interesting, so tell us a little bit more about that. Are you using uh, JAMP Pro for your Mac OS and school for iOS or what does that, what does that makeup look like? 
So we made the decision um, during the COVID times, we didn't wanna take the um, students and make them have to wipe their devices to start into Jamf school. Mm -hmm. um, so we made the decision to stick with the students that were already enrolled in Jamf Pro. And just as we integrated new devices, we would then begin to basically move out of Jamf Pro. Um, so in, in our first year, our freshmen were on Jamf School, while the rest of our sophomore, juniors, and seniors were on Jamf Pro. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, which was this school year, we were freshmen and sophomore on Jamf School and juniors and seniors on Jamf Pro. Gotcha. Then for the next school year, beginning 2022, 2023, we were originally going to go with our seniors sticking with Jamf Pro, but our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors would be Jamf School. However, we have learned that all of the things that we love about Jamf School, we're not able to do with Jamf Pro. Um, and so we want to be able to have that opportunity to use with all of our students. And so we have made the decision that we will move all of our students to Jamf School this for this next school year. Fantastic. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. I think the, the only follow-up question I have for you on that one was, what, what specifically drew you to Jamf School? I know you just touched on some of those features and things that really um, work super well for you in, in, in talking about Jamf School. Can you expand on that a little bit for us and our audience to talk about you know, specifically what, what that looks like for you and, and why it's so impactful? Sure. So one of the biggest benefits that I personally feel is huge to Jamf School is the time filters. Um, we are able to apply specific time filters so that from the time the students walk into the building, from the time that the bell rings, and it's a different time because we have on Thursdays, we have early dismissal. So even on Thursdays, I can have a different schedule for the students than I have on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, so that when they are in the school building, if I don't want them to have access to iMessage, I can completely disable that and it will disappear off of their iPad. Once that three o'clock bell rings, that time filter goes off and those applications come back to their device. Um, so it makes it much easier for teachers in terms of eliminating those distractions. Um, they don't even have to worry about it because we have pushed those time filters to them so that those distractions are gone. The other one that we do in addition to like iMessage would be our social media. So mm -hmm. we eliminate all social media apps during the school day. Um, and then at three o'clock when that school bell rings, those applications come back on their device. Got it. That's really cool. That's a great workflow. Um, and thank you for sharing that. I think one of the things too that you alluded to in the question before is the fact that you're running both, right? You're running Jamf Pro and Jamf School at the same time. And that's something, so my team works with existing customers as well. And it's something we see a lot of. So the fact that you're doing it as well as um, you know, proof that it works and it can be done because we have so many customers that started with the days of Casper Suite and now mm -hmm. they kind of want to make that transition over to Jamf School and it's it's very doable, it's very possible and you guys are absolutely thriving in that environment. So uh, thank you for sharing about that and that's that's fantastic. So I'll ask one more question. I'll let Emily jump in and monopolizing here a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you, you touched on the teacher aspect just a moment ago. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us about how your teachers are leveraging technology doesn't have to be Jamf specifically, uh, but what they're using with technology and, and how that process works for, for them and, and how it helps kind of enable the students in the classroom. Sure. So I'll first start with um, the idea that teachers can use Jamf Teacher. Um, so really and truly, I really wish we would have had Jamf School in the COVID, like 2019, 2020. That was first three months or two and a half months of COVID, I really wish we would have already been on Jamf School at that time. Um, but what we learned the next year was that teachers could actually um, lock down the student devices. So if they were taking an assessment, which we all know during COVID, several students either worked from home, you know, we were hybrid, we had 50-50. Um, and so those students that were at home were doing the same thing that the students in the classroom were doing. But if it was a test day, those students got the benefit of, you know, they were taking the test at home. Um, so I, the teacher being able to lock down that device and restricting them to only have access to Schoology or Notability, those are the, our, our student information system, or I'm sorry, our LMS, 
mm -hmm. um, learning management system that we use is Schoology. Um, and then our students use Notability for note taking. So maybe it was an open note test or something and they wanted them only to have access to Notability and Schoology. Our teachers could easily have locked those down um, to where they just have access to that. Our math teachers currently, that is exactly what they do in the classroom every day. Um, they will lock it down to where they just have access to that online assessment that they're doing um, so that they know that it's a genuine work um, and that they don't have access to other resources other than maybe a calculator or whatever it is that they need for that test. Mm -hmm. The teachers are able to use um, their assessments and make them real life assessments, whether that's through digital design, virtual reality, you know, one of our teachers, they created modern reenactment of stories from the Bible. Um, and then we have a daily news broadcast. They use their iPads in the classroom every day to um, film a news segment, publish it, and then air it out to all of the school in that, that afternoon. Cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. That's awesome. So I'm going to kind of take the other side of the coin on that. You talked a lot about how the educators and and are using the tools and that sort of thing. What was the student response to being locked out and not being able to get to all of the things they typically have at their fingertips and really just having that kind of scaffolded environment of the assessment or the apps or the or the digital tools that the educator has chosen for that time? How has been how's been their like experience and response? So obviously, initially at first, um, they weren't necessarily happy with it or felt sure. like it was, um, felt like you were, the teacher wasn't necessarily spying on them or could see something. Um, we had previously used Apple Classroom. Um, and so they were familiar with like what Apple Classroom could do. And so it took some convincing to explain, like, I can't physically see what you're doing at any given moment. Like, I'm just giving you the tools that you need or the teacher's giving you the tools that you need so that you're successful and you don't have those distractions. Mm -hmm. um, but it, there was there was definitely some pushback. Um, the students weren't necessarily happy, but in the end, um, there wasn't really that much pushback from, I mean, there was pushback, but not like terrible. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I mean, you, you already described, you're working with ninth to 12th graders. So there's there's adjustment in, in just life in general, right? During that timeline. So let's look a little bit about, you know, when, when you're bringing in this new um, management or new devices or new insert, whatever technology or resource, how are you um, as a technology specialist working with your educators and administrators and, and campus staff on really integrating um, those tools into the instructional design? So we have our back to school professional development sessions um, where we get together at the beginning of every school year um, and we will set aside different PD sessions. Um, the year of COVID, we actually did like breakout sessions and teachers signed up for different sessions that they could go to so that they could really hone in on what they needed to use in the classroom to be successful um, rather than, you know, those first three months we literally were like, I think everyone was pretty much sinking before they were swimming, you know, like um, everyone was just thrown into this. And then, so the next school year, we really tried to go back a step and say, okay, we know you were thrown into it, but we want to give you what resources we can give you so that you can be successful and just start with the basics. It's okay to just go with the basics. Um, so we do that and that happens every year. Um, it also happens. We have occasional professional development days built into the calendar throughout the year. If something needs to be addressed, a faculty meeting. Um, I specifically introduced Jamf teacher to our teachers during one of those sessions um, in 2020-2021. Um, and then I, every year we'll have a refresher for our new teachers on how to use it in the classroom. Um, but not only that is we have my position. So as the educational technology specialist, one of my roles is to support the teachers. Mm -hmm. So if there's something specific in the classroom or something specific to a lesson or whatever it might be, I am available to help the teacher and I'm not in a classroom all the time. Awesome. So you're a, an added resource that can go in and help. Absolutely. Love it. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Next question for me would be, um, how has using Jamf impacted your instructional practice at your school? I think um, specifically to Jamf, I feel like, you know, maybe I've answered that question and that they're able to, um, 
you know, push specific applications to those devices. Um, you know, if a teacher needed them to access to only that, they could use the Jamf teacher app. But in terms of the Jamf management side or the admin side, I am able to push apps to them so that it's ready to go in the classroom before class even starts. So if, um, like for example, we use Notability, we push Notability out to all of our freshman iPads from the moment we start our iPads. Um, if they go into um, their technology class and maybe they need some STEM apps, um, I can actually remotely push those apps to them so that when they get into the classroom, they're ready to go. They don't have to take that time to download that app for that what lesson or whatever it is that they're doing for that day. Um, and everything is ready for them at their, fin their fingertips. Yeah, that's great. Kind of just removing that barrier of, I want this thing, we need to use this for, for learning, but who knows how long is it going to take? She had to come in here, click the app store, download everything. Like we can eliminate all that, which is, which right. is great to hear you using that in real life. So very cool. Thank you. All right. One of my last questions here is about you personally and kind of your role and keeping with the whole app conversation. What are some of your favorite educational apps that you are using? I would say Notability. Mm -hmm. um, we use them and we encourage our students to use them as their note-taking device. Um, we have them create different folders for each one of their classes. And some of the students will even break it down by A day and B day. We do a um, block scheduling model and then they'll organize their folders so that when they come to class, you know, they can expand their A day folder mm -hmm. and then all of their classes for that day, all of their notes are right there. Um, Another one that I personally have loved even since teaching kindergarten is Explain Everything. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love making films. There's all kinds of filmmaking applications out there. I just really like Explain Everything um, since it was even free. It's not free anymore. Well, right. you have to have the subscription. But when it was, back when it was free, um, I loved it. Um, Procreate, our students use Procreate um, and some of their artwork that they are able to create and procreate is amazing. Um, digital artwork has truly been something at Mercy that I have loved to watch them design. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I probably would say Canva. It's just fun to make posters and things just, you know, it's better than just making a PowerPoint or, you know. Mm -hmm. I love that Canva allows you to like show your personality a little bit and yeah. I mean, I don't know if you caught on, but I'm a little sassy and I love, I love to add a little flair to a, to a digital print and that sort of thing. So yeah, Canva, I love Canva. It's so much fun. Dan, do you have any other questions? I think the last one for me would be if you had an ed tech wish list of things that you could do or want, what would that kind of entail and what would that include? Probably anything virtual reality. Hmm. Um, I think the, the way that virtual reality has changed um, where students can see field trips, where students can actually, you know, go from place to place. Um, anything virtual reality would be amazing. Cool. I think that's it for me in terms of questions. Um, yeah. Well, in keeping with the theme of Jamf Breakfast Club, I hope everybody who was able to join us was able to catch a quick bite to eat. And again, we just want to thank you, Amanda, for joining us all the way from Chicago and Louisville, I know you're not in Louisville right now, but from Chicago on your summer and your time off, we really appreciate you joining us and connecting with Dan and I um, for Jamp Breakfast Club. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks Amanda. I have Miss Melissa here. Miss Melissa, why do you love Jamp? It is vital to our sanity in managing the iPads in our district. Hi there. Hey there. Can you tell me what you love about iPad? So my son is 14 years old. He has autism. Um, he's brilliant. He's super creative, very weird. Learned how to speak because of the iPad. We still have his very first generation iPad, still in his cute little blue and green case. I don't think it works anymore, but he would find apps that actually had video closed captioning and he literally learned to speak because he could read but he couldn't talk. So he would read that closed captioning and slowly but surely, swipe or no swiping meant, hey, big sister, please don't take my uh, carrot sticks, right? But he learned how to speak and communicate because of the iPad. Always super thrilled that that was something that was a tool available for us at the time.
Fantastic. Yeah. And that's my jam. What do you love about your iPad? So I love the portability. So I'm sitting here for about an hour and a half at ISTE 22 and watching all the people walk by and getting my work done. Not only using the native apps, but I also have my desktop in my office connected right now. So the things I can't do if I'm not in the office, I'm sitting here doing on my iPad, like approving the mundane stuff, like approving vacation time because everybody wants to leave right now and approving requisitions and things like that. So it allows me the flexibility to do what I need to do. That's my jam. All right, my name is Olivia Mason, seventh grade ELA teacher from Montgomery Public Schools in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, we are getting ready to go once more with iPads this upcoming school year. So I'm super excited to see what JMF has in store. Thank you.